Namaste. Welcome to Cairo Yoga, the practice in which healing and movement unite. The topic of today's discussion is going to be IAP. Now I know what you're thinking, what in the down dog is IAP? Well, we're going to go over three important points today. What is IAP? Why is it important in general and in our asana practice? And thirdly, when and how should we utilize IAP? So, IAP actually stands for intra-abdominal pressure. And as you might have already intuited, that means pressure that is built up within the abdominal cavity. Now to give you some context, I'm gonna go over some of the models I have on the whiteboard. This model here is of the torso. If I were to slice my body in half this way, and you were to look through this way, this is what we would see. You have the spine here. This is the back muscles, the tailbone or sacrum, the pelvic floor, the pubic bone up front and abdomen. Here's the sternum or breastbone, and this is the diaphragm. This is the important muscle that's gonna be getting all the attention today. This other model over here is if I took a slice through the body this way. So we took a slice through my body here and I was to look in just like this, this is what we would see. It's a bird's eye view. And so this is the back where the spine and the back muscles are. This is the front where the six pack muscle is, the rectus abdominis. And then this is gonna be the obliques, external oblique, internal oblique, coming around the sides of the abdomen like this. So, getting back to the diaphragm, the all-important muscle of today's discussion. The diaphragm is a parachute-shaped muscle, and what that means is that the top of the diaphragm is actually higher than its peripheral connections to the torso. This muscle separates the torso into two different compartments. Above is the thoracic cavity, also known as the chest cavity, that houses the lungs and the heart. Below the diaphragm is the abdominal pelvic cavity. In there, you have your small intestine, large intestine, liver, spleen, pancreas, kidneys, and etc. A bunch of stuff. There are two important functions of the diaphragm. And as any good yogi knows, the main one is for diaphragmatic breathing. So the main function of the diaphragm is for the respiration process or the breathing process. As the top of that parachute goes down, when the diaphragm contracts, it lowers down towards the floor. This is gonna change the pressure and volume within the thoracic cavity where the lungs are, and that results in air coming into the lungs. Now we're gonna review the anatomy, physiology, and mechanics of the respiration process at a later time. So look forward to that lecture. The second function of the diaphragm is that it enhances postural stabilization. Well, what does that mean? As the diaphragm contracts and the top of that parachute lowers down towards the pelvic floor, the content of the abdomen is pushed down and outward towards the edges. We can represent this in our models with a circle here representing the content of the abdomen. And these arrows representing the forces that are generated when the diaphragm comes down upon the content as it contracts. Now, as that force is generated and the force is going out towards the edges of the abdomen, this is going to activate all of the muscles around this area, which we usually group together and call the core musculature it activates and makes those muscles contract. And what that does, it is actually creating an opposite force going the other way. This helps out and enhances the creation of intra-abdominal pressure. Now, with the generation of intra-abdominal pressure and the contraction of the muscles of the core simultaneously, we have actually turned our torso into a stable cylinder. To give you an analogy of what this looks like, imagine a soccer ball. A soccer ball is at its strongest and most resilient when it's filled up with air. 
that air is exerting pressure from the inside out and makes it resistant to any outside forces. Without the air though, it doesn't matter how thick the panels are on the outside, it still wouldn't be as strong as if it was filled up with air and had that pressure. Similarly, without the pressure that's created within the abdominal cavity, we are putting some of the panels, the individual panels of our body under more stress during movement than it needs to be. And this could be ligaments, joints, muscles, tendons, fascia, pretty much anything that we could think about in the body. So why is it important to create this stable torso or stable cylinder? Well, let's use the example of a backhoe. This is a piece of construction machinery that's used to dig dirt out of the earth. Now, the first thing that an engineer of one of these machines will do is lay down the stabilizer rods next to the tractor component. This creates a stable base before he starts to move the crane and bucket. Now, the most functional part of this machine is the crane and the bucket, although that functional part is thoroughly dependent upon the stability of its base, the tractor component. Now, this is very similar to our own body, our torso and our limbs. Our limbs work tremendously more efficient if it has a stable base, the torso, to work from. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't move our spine at all. Similar to the construction machine, the stable base has to have all of the parts within the base working efficiently and moving in between one another efficiently to accommodate for the movement of the crane. Same thing with our body and our spine. Our spine should be able to move all of the parts efficiently in order to accommodate for the bigger movements of our limbs. So, with the creation of intra-abdominal pressure, this is what creates that stable base. Another example of this type of relationship is that of a slingshot. The ability of the slingshot to create tension is dependent upon the handle staying stable as the rubber band piece stretches and moves back. So all of this is to say that when we have a stable base from which we can move our limbs and appropriately transfer and disperse forces throughout the body, then we decrease the likelihood of any one individual panel taking on any more stress than it needs to. Whether that be in a pose or in everyday life, such as picking up your child, going for a walk, mowing the lawn, and much more. So, when should we be utilizing this technique? To a certain extent, all the time. The only caveat is that the amount of pressure we should generate should meet or match the demands of the task at hand. For example, if I'm just standing in Tadasana or going for a leisureful walk, then the amount of pressure I should generate should be minimal. But if I'm holding a more challenging pose or doing a more demanding task, such as picking up my child, then I need to generate a little bit more pressure to meet the demands of that task. So the question of when and how much is really all the time and it depends. So now that we've reviewed what IAP is, why it's important for our asana practice in everyday life, and when and how we should be utilizing this technique, you're probably wondering, well, teach me how to do it. You'll find out how in the next video. Namaste.